Zap Live. Um, when we had Zap Live back in August, um, we had a little sound test uh, before the uh, before the talk. Um, but actually, the sound's working pretty well. I think everyone can hear me. Can everyone hear me at the back? Steve, can you hear me? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So the sound's all right. Last night I was testing the, the screen, uh, making sure all the colours were nice, because we like the colours to look nice, don't we? Um, and I tested all of them, apart from brown. <laughs> now, I didn't have time to do brown, so the only thing we've got to do is just to run for a quick brown test to make sure the brown's working okay on the screen, and then we'll get on with the talk, right? So, so anyway, let's get on with the test. So yeah, yeah, it's looking good. Yeah, yeah, that brown looks good to me. Oh, some more brown, yes, yeah, lovely. And another, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, oh, very nice, yeah, all bit of yellow, yeah, and another, yeah, there's only 400 of these, don't worry, um, yeah, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, okay, yeah, no, 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 I think, I think the brown's working good, isn't it, so thanks to the Commodore 64 there, none of Andrew's games there, of course, because he didn't use brown in his games, well, not much, anyway, and to be fair, Let's be fair here, you know, we're all friends, it's like 40 years later and everything. And the Commodore 64 didn't just do brown, it also did hazel, umber, beige, sepia, brunette, <laughs> and my favourite, burnt sienna. <laughs> so, and a range of greys. Oh yes, of course, not forgetting the greys as well, yes, good point Steve. So, so anyway, let's get on with the talk now. And um, obviously Graph Gold, uh, one of my favourite developers back in the 80s and the 90s. And um, these guys um, basically grew up uh, with computers, or the early part of computers, uh, mainframes and so forth, and, uh, and they grew up and uh, started programming on all sorts of things, including this wonderful machine, the ZX80. So this was uh, Steve's first computer, so I'll hand over to him to tell us a little bit about his uh, first experience with the ZX80. I think it still looks space age. It, it, it just doesn't look like anything else. And I got my first one as a kit form through the post. And I can remember opening up the box and seeing all these little bits. And even my wife actually loved, she, she helped me put it all together and, and whatever. But when I'd done that, I, I felt really disappointed because it, it was almost just like Lego. And I, I thought I'd learn a bit about computers by putting it all together. But you didn't need, you just had to follow instructions really. It's a bit like making a bit of Ikea or something. <laughs> so, but, but it, it kind of started me off. I felt, I, I, I want to know how this thing works. So I went down and we had a, a, a good library of technical sections. So I got a load of books on chips and especially Z80. And that's how I kind of got into and I started to try and figure out, well, how, how the hell did this, this thing works? I couldn't see any graphic chips. Or, or any way that it's getting the stuff on the screen. And I, I thought, well, it, it's got to be doing it somehow. And because and, um, I wanted to do games on it, and I wanted moving games, but the, the silly thing, as soon as you started your program off, it all just went grey. <laughs> and you couldn't see anything. It was only when, when your, your program stopped that you saw your stuff on the screen. And, and so I, I spent um, a few months kind of. Uh, reverse engineering the, the, the thing, disassembling the, uh, the ROM, and that, that was before any of the, the disassembly books actually come out, I mean, I mean later, I found whole books that, that done the, the, the same thing, but in, in particular the first bit of the ROM had, had um, where it does the interrupts and whatever, and I, I found out how it was getting the characters on the screen using a combination of uh, a timing chip and the CPU, and I thought, right, now I can do them a, a game, so I, I programmed a little graphic of an asteroid and the code had to be exactly the right length in time every cycle and, and you waited till the raster went off the screen by using an interrupt then you tried to get your code in and you had to code it exactly the right length so when the raster come back on the top of the screen you had an interrupted to time and if you didn't get that time right the thing looked like one of those old tellies that used to I don't know whether any of you are old enough for, for the old um, line tellies. They used to wrap round all the time, but, but that's the kind of effect you had. And when you got that, you, you, you added up all the T-states and every instruction that, that you've done. And, and remember, I'm writing in hex, not, not in anything else. And you adjusted it until the thing kind of um, looked like an asteroid. And 
one day I actually got an asteroid going across and I had a witness there and that was the only time I did it and the next day I, I opened up a magazine and the, the ZX81 was there and I was so distraught. I spent three months trying to get this one asteroid moving across the screen. <laughs> And it's, it's funny you mention asteroids as well because uh, uh, not, this, not, not just growing up, but as, as young adults in uh, Whitham and Chelmsford in Essex, um, you both of you separately to start off with like to uh, obviously frequent all the local pubs. And uh, I think this is where your love of games, because you mentioned that the first thing you wanted to do on the ZX80 was produce a game. And your, this came from your love of games, which was playing uh, arcade machines, uh, particularly this one in uh, the various uh, drinking establishments. So maybe, Andrew, you could uh, tell us a little bit about your early experiences with Asteroids and its uh, ilk. Yeah, Asteroids actually was in the chip shop at the end, so that was always our last visit of the Friday night. We would um, we would go around, around probably four or five pubs uh, to, to play four or five different games, because each they, I don't know whether the pub owners had all talked to each other to make sure that they didn't have the same game. But they always had something different um, from each other. So we we'd, we'd, we'd tour around on a Friday night. We'd go around to all the machines that, that we liked. There was Battle Zone and Breakout uh, at the time, um, and Space Invaders, uh, Missile Command. This one was was the end of the end of the road of, of the, the the Friday evening for us because the chip shop had this one and uh, getting your bag of chips and uh, playing this playing this game. Probably took a bit longer than, than it would normally take just to get some chips, but uh, yeah, we, we, we love this game, uh, and it was, that was a, a, a we, we we weren't that good at it particularly, but we, but we all loved this one, and we we always played it every Friday night. And of course, um, playing games such as these, it obviously influenced both of your early careers. Um, um, Steve's uh, with uh, the three D Space Wars games, which we'll get onto in a second. But of course, going back to uh, the ZX80, ZX81 situation, um, having seen this advert for the ZX81, Steve, um, very quickly uh, it was eclipsed again, wasn't it, by this lovely machine? Well, absolutely. Having sort of missed out the ZX81 and thinking, oh, yeah, you know, I'm not going to buy that after I've, I've wasted all my time on one, one machine and, and whatever. When I read the first ad, this thing does colour and it can do moving graphics. I thought, right, I'm going to get one of the first ones of these and this time I'll apply the knowledge that, that I already know and work out how this one works and, and I, I was sure that I could do the same sort of thing that was around in the arcades at the time. So, uh, yeah, I, I duly bought one of the first Spectrums, got my order in. It was only a, a 16K one, which was a bit of a mistake. So I, I I bought one of those extension RAMs, and I don't know whether any of you had one of those, but you you just press the little rubber key a little bit too hard, the thing on the back wobbled, <laughs> and that's it. All your work just kind of disappears in front of your eyes. Yeah. And uh, luckily, my wife um, didn't mind typing it all in again for me. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, the long suffering Julie. Yes, okay, fair enough. And then ob obviously combining the spectrum and you know moving colour graphics, were he? And um, your love of arcade games, obviously your first game was arcade themed 3D Space Wars. It, it was, and funnily enough, it was actually kind of influenced by Space Invaders, because the idea was to take Space Invaders and put it into a, a 3D environment. So, you know, you know, the little ships, they start in the distance and they come towards you. I thought, oh, I won't have them in just a boring pattern, I'll make them a little bit more freeform. But, but essentially it's the same, same mechanism, you, you've got di different levels and, and uh, each level gets harder and has more and more, more ships. But, but, but very simplistic, but it was well within the capabilities of what, abilities of what the Spectrum could do. Yeah, great, great little game as well, very playable, and of course this being 1983, yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty much uh, what everyone was sort of playing, the, these sorts of games. And, and then, obviously, at this point, Graph Gold is uh, uh, nowhere near to be seen, is it? You're, you're trading under as, as a sole trader. Yeah, I, I started off just on my own. And I, I think I lasted about two months on my own. I was getting really bored. And I'd already met Andrew. I, I think we met, actually, by an arcade machine. A mutual friend sort of introduced, oh, this guy writes 
games on, on his mainframe at, at work. <laughs> In my own time, I wish to, yeah, I wish to point out that that was in my own time in the year. <laughs> I wasn't writing during the day, but everybody cleared out the office at one minute past five. That was leaving time, and the, and the big bosses made sure nobody left before that time. So everybody packed up their desk at about one minute two five and was sitting there with their arms folded. Nobody was allowed to move until one minute past five, and then the office cleared. So suddenly I had the whole office to myself, I had all the terminals. Um, and, and I could just sit there and, and, and it wasn't really, I, I would sit there until the security guard came round at about 10 o'clock on his rounds and I knew it was time that I, I should go home. Um, but yeah, it was great having the whole machine's attention. Uh, I could type in the academic programs, test them online um, and I, you couldn't do that during the day because you have to share six terminals between 40 people. Um, so. Uh, I, I was proving to myself that there was a better way of developing programs full stop if, if you could actually have access to a machine, machine all, all the day because most of the time we were sitting at our desks poring over listings um, and that, that seemed inefficient to me but so in the evenings I was really improving the, the, the way I was working um, and writing games at the same time so uh, it was a win every way. And away from computers, uh, yourself and Steve were, um, were, were forging a, a friendship elsewhere, weren't you, with regards to the uh, musical? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Because Andrew played bass guitar and I played lead guitar in, in a little local band. Uh, I don't think we, we, we were sort of much good, but it, 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 it was great fun. It, it, we, we, we kind of played all original numbers in those days. It wasn't covers, was it? Uh, Andrew and his Rick and Backer, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> Geddy Lee look alike, <laughs> long hair. I, I don't think I had long hair in those days, did, did I? But yeah, yeah so it was quite good. So, so we, we already had a shared interest. And because um, when, when I found out he could program, and I'm sitting all alone, you know, getting a bit kind of uh, a, a, a sort of. Uh, Manic, just just me and the computer and, and sitting, sort of staring at a screen on a blank, blank wall. Well, well, one one Friday night, I just said, "Do you want to join me?" And yes, please. Yes, please. <laughs> and we went to the pub and had, had a drink, and, and and that was that. And um, I, I copied the contract. We were both professional programmers before we got into games, so it was unusual. We were never kind of like the bedroom programmers type people, but it gave us a kind of bit of an advantage because we knew how to do kind of um, structured flow charts um, and design the programme. So e even though we didn't programme the same kind of language, I, I could draw little charts of how my games work and hand them over. And we had that kind of language that we, we could speak. And then and Andrew used to take my little diagrams and then just code them up in 6809 on the Dragon. Oh, yes, the Dragon 32, Wales is pride. So tell us, tell us a bit about the Dragon 32, Andrew, and because obviously this was, uh, a lot of people think you started off on the Commodore 64, but of course you had one of these before and you used it to convert Steve's uh, first game, 3D Space Wars, I believe. Yeah. It was all down to my dad, really, because I, I started the same way as Steve with a, my dad bought a ZX80, which was a kit, and he put it together because he loved putting things together. Um, then we, we did go to the ZX81, but it was, it was really my dad's, uh, annoyance with the rubber keys and the fact that the machine wasn't very stable sitting on the ground. That he wanted a proper keyboard because I, I think he wanted to write letters and things on his on his computer. So we picked one of those because um, it was a little bit before the Commodore 64, um, and that one looked a bit more solid. So uh, my, my, my it was yeah, it's all down to my dad really because he paid for the machine, but then I was the one that got to use it most of the time. Um, and yeah, I, I enjoyed learning on that machine um, because it, you, you could type nice and easily on, on the keyboard and uh, there was plenty of information about it because it was based on the Tandy colour computer. So I got uh, a manual for that, I got a book for 6809 Assembler um, and just started teaching myself um, how to write a proper routine without an assembler to start with but I was at least writing out the code on, in, on a piece of paper then I had to work out all the hex for it poke that into the machine and then run it and uh, I was just proving to myself that yeah I, I can do it but it's hard work um, and then we got a proper assembler for it and a couple of disk drives um, and, and it was a nice machine to work on. 
And it's good, good, good to cut your teeth, wasn't it? At least, if nothing else. And and it does have a very nice keyboard. So. And I must admit, I was jealous <laughs> of, of this lovely keyboard sitting, doing me rubber keys that sometimes wouldn't work. Although I I, I love the smell of the Spectrum, the little feel of it, and the little, <laughs> little curve. But I I bought a a big keyboard and then mounted my circuit board in that keyboard, and that got rid of my my problems of. of Pressing too hard and it all kind of uh, uh, disappeared. But I, I, I must say, I've, I've still got the original or, or the second Spectrum because I bought a forty-eight K Spectrum, and I've still got that that at home. And I've never actually got got rid of that. That's in my cupboard. But my my big keyboard and the dis, the additional disk drives and all, all the non kind of Sinclair stuff is, is all gone. But I'm, I've got, got the, the little black box. <laughs> excellent, excellent. And um, obviously, as we've already seen, your early games were published by uh, this company, Hewson. And um, they, they were obviously integral to Graph Gold, certainly in its early years anyway. So, Steve, tell us about um, your relationship with Hewson and how it began with the, uh, with the Sidab trilogy. It was very good. So, my first game, I... I sent to three publishers, and two of them replied and said, oh, we're interested, come up and see us. And the, the other one I got, oh, you know, it's nice, but send us something else. So, uh, you know, they, they lost out. And I, I chose Hewson because he, he, he actually went to my school, and uh, we, which kind of immediately kind of gave us a, a, a sort of bond. We knew all the, the, the same area. And, and whatever I, I didn't realize I, I think he was a couple of years above me but I didn't know him at school but you know we, we, we talked about that but his key thing he he decided that he was going to do his own tape duplication so he had this little, little a unit on an industrial estate and he could make up all his tapes and I realized that was a really shrewd move because um, instead of having to order loads of tapes and try and guess how many you're going to sell and um, whatever, he he could just print them off as as need be. And he, his dad used to run the uh, tape machine, so it's very much a family business. And his his brother used to be the product manager. I, I, I don't remember his his wife or his mum kind of doing anything, but. But it, it was it was a nice kind of friendly family business, and he seemed to um, have a very very good relation to to the press in the early days. And he used to take us there, and he introduced us. And we had these lovely little kind of press parties whenever we had a launch of our products, and and it made you feel that kind of that that you were part of that publishing process. And we kind of lost that completely. In, in the the later years, but you know it was it was a sort of lovely time, and, and it was a very kind of close relationship. But the most important thing of all, he didn't tell us what to do. We had complete control. He commented things when we we took it to him, but he didn't say, "Oh, yeah, I think you should do this sort of game. It's got to be this, and it's it's got to be this." He'd, he'd just say, "Well, I don't know what that is." What was that? When I first took him at Avalon, he he sort of looked at it and. Well, I had a wizard that fired wizards walking around rooms picking up wizards, so you had to use a bit of imagination. <laughs> but all, all of a sudden, when I, when I got a couple of graphics in, he suddenly twigged and, and realised that, that, that that was something else. But he recognised a good game when he saw it, and so, so did his brother. And that, that's really the key thing. So he knew and he trusted that he could just leave us to do our bit, and we more or less left him do his bit. Although... We, we we wanted far more control because when we saw some of the first artwork, we thought, well, why doesn't it look like the game? Why don't you look at the game? I, I think that the, the um, 3D Space Wars and cover you saw is perhaps one of the best because it, mm. it relates to the game, but, but some we weren't very happy. I think the Paradoid one was the one we were least uh, happy with. Yeah, yeah, that did, didn't really reflect the game too well, did it? But, um, but the next game, after this lovely picture of you wearing a Space Invaders jumper, Steve. Yeah, I think Andrew Hewson took that photo himself. I, I, I said that must have been your favourite jumper. It it was, and I think that picture was which used. I, I did a series of articles for a magazine. I think it was Sinclair User. Uh, Hewson, <laughs> Hewson used to uh, write for the magazine, and he said, "Oh, yeah, you know, I haven't got time to do this. Do, you know, would you like to write for them?" So I, I I took it over and used to do a kind of double page spread. 
They, um, I think it's called So You Want to Be a Programmer. And you can still get those articles on, on, on the web and they, they, they're quite fun to, to, to look at. Bring in. I think, oh, that, you know, it's, it's actually quite good to, um, when I put there. But uh, that, that was the picture that, that they used. When, when, of, and uh, the thing that I, I, I learned, I don't know whether as, as a writer you've, you've learned this trick, mm. we used to get paid for the page. And the more diagrams and pictures I put up, the quicker <laughs> it was to do. No, sadly, sadly that doesn't happen anymore, but anyway. <laughs> uh, mo moving on, let's move on to the games, because that's uh, what, what we all love really, isn't it? And uh, this, this one uh, is called 3D Sidab Attack, which uh, Sidab is obviously baddies backwards, which is quite a nice name still. I, I remember thinking that was quite cool still. And um, I don't know if anyone can see uh, the influence of a certain um, sci-fi film in the cover. Anyone know? War of the Worlds. Correct. Yeah, well done. Well done. Yes, War of the Worlds. And, and initially, 3D side ab attack. Uh, Steve rather optimistically wanted to call it War of the Worlds until uh, obviously someone got in touch. A little tap on the shoulder from Andrew Houston, I believe it was, wasn't it? Yeah, he, he phoned me up one day. So I've just had a phone call from a big lawyer in Hollywood and they're going to sue us unless we change the name. <laughs> and I said, but, but it's public domain. You know, the author's been dead for, for God knows how long long years. And, and it, they say, oh, well, they say they've got the rights to the film and that's you know, that's a recent property and, and whatever. And I haven't got the money to pay for the legal fees, so we'll have to change the name. This was all a couple of days before the release. And so we didn't know what to call it. And I, I think Gordon Hewson came up with a name and and uh, you know, it, it, it fitted so Jobs are good, yeah. <laughs> very quick bit of uh, changing of the title screen and, and whatever. Yeah, and uh, what uh, you, you, obviously it's another space type shooting game, but um, you, you were obviously um, experimenting with different techniques and uh, working in different frames and uh, get, getting different styles of graphics. So this is um, 3D side ab attack. The, the side ab have invaded Earth. It was at the plot, and you're defending Earth. So that it's basically a ground-based shooter. Was it the moon? I can't remember. No, no, it was the Earth. And yeah. the, again, there's a little bit of a space invaders influence in this, in, in that the armors like the little bases at, at the bottom of space invaders. So, so when the the alien missiles kind of come, they they gradually eat mm -hmm. away away your armor. So, so all I was doing was sort of wrapping it up. And, and this, this time it's almost like, well, instead of lots of space invaders, you've got the little space buses that used to go across the, the top of attacking you. Mm -hmm. But the idea for the city at night came in a dream. I, I was dreaming that I was a computer show and I saw this magnificent game that was just done by putting all the lights on the screen. And it was a helicopter flying over in New York. And, and I was thinking, well, that is a brilliant idea. I wish I'd thought of that. And then I woke up and I thought, I have thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I immediately started drawing the diagrams and, and testing it out. And, and the, the effect, I, mean, I hadn't seen anything like it. I thought, oh, wow, that, yeah, that, that really works. Yeah, it looked, it, looked, it looked a really good game at the time. I remember playing it and, and notably quicker and a bit more impressive than a lot of the other games that came out. And then after that, you um, concluded the original trilogy with 3D... Loon attack, uh, which again you tweaked things a bit, bit, bit nicer uh, loading screen this time, and uh, it's it's again kind of ground based, but with with some aerial sections as well. So um, tell tell us a bit about the the genesis of this one. Yeah, I mean I I was looking at doing a kind of flight simulation. I quickly realised that, that at the time that doing sort of loop the loops and making the horizon completely kind of go upside down was, was beyond what I could do on, on the, the spectrum. So, so I thought, well, let, let's put the horizon as, as several sort of sprites and let's see how far I can get away with, with not actually tilting the, the sprite. So it's all illusion and, and your mind sort of sees the whole thing as, as kind of tilting. But it, it, yeah, if everything is actually horizontal. So, so uh, I could get the, the speed up and, and I've, my, my one thing that I, I, I wished I'd, I'd done a little bit different in, in Cider Attack was, was when, when I sort of played it after it was released, I thought, oh damn, I've, I've made the, the main tank just a little bit too slow. So in this, this and, and it, it wasn't because the game was slow, it, it was just the speed that I put in and I could have changed that. So in this one, I thought, right, I'm going to get the speed in this one and get the kind of freedom of movement, and, and uh, that, which, which made it quite... <coughs> 
different and, and I wanted to get the the site like a predictive site which was some 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 people I showed the game to didn't quite get and they're saying well the bullets don't go towards your site but they you know they drop with gravity down to the ground and then the predictive site shows you w w where the bullet will be like, like when, when 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 you you fire it yeah. and, and it's also was um, different in that the mode of the game changes when you lift the the site up past the horizon it changes into aerial mode and then then you get a missile coming in and and the, the, uh, the little things that, that look like a Hawker Harrier jets kind of come in and, and, and they they were designed just to make you panic because I think you had about five seconds before they uh, come close enough to uh, re really uh, cause damage to you so uh, you had to get get your sight up there and a, a missile fired off but, but I, I like that element of putting pressure on a player at times yeah yeah it was very good and of course Andrew this was your first Commodore 64 game so if we can uh, go go back to you and you talk to us a bit, bit about uh, so he's no brown there is there yeah <laughs> he knew what he was doing he's no brown uh, tell us a little bit about this conversion yeah I well I, I first converted Steve's Side our trilogy onto the Dragon 32. We found out that Dragon 32 sales really weren't up to up to much, and they were, they were heading downwards. So um, I switched uh, to the Commodore 64, um, and and I converted my own version of it, I suppose, because I still wasn't getting the source code off of Steve. We just had the diagrams, as he said, um, and this this time. I, I thought, well, I've got to get used to a new machine, so uh, let's let's do a game that I already know, um, and let's use the Commodore 64 as an ZX Spectrum because it's in high res mode. Um, so we're using none of the toys that that that, that machine had got, but uh, I, I got used to uh, hardware sprites and things, um, and and wrote uh, a, a bigger version of of Lunatac because uh, Steve's original was on the 16k Spectrum, then I did put it on a 32k Dragon 32. And finally, on a 64K Commodore 64, so I was getting more space every time. So I was thinking of new things I could put in there to use up a bit of the extra space. Um, so I put maps and things in this one. Um, but I was just trying to stay stay true to the original game um, and and follow follow somebody else's design before I got got a chance to do my own designs. And again, it's quite interesting because you're cutting your teeth, aren't you? Like you did on the Dragon 32 with programming, now you're with games design, you're taking someone else's games design and just refining it a little bit and, and, and learning how to how to do this. It takes a lot of the pressure off because you're only you, you, you're learning to do part of the job at a time and, and you know the design already works because you've already done it and somebody else has already done it as well. So yeah, just, just you can concentrate on just learning how, how the assembler works and, uh, and, and the tools, all the development tools you've got to learn as well and how to uh, design all your graphics. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's good to learn a bit at a time and then, then you can move on to the next stage. Now at, at this point, the two of you, it's just the two of you still, and uh, you're working in uh, Steve's house together they didn't have an office or anything like that so i imagine it look up if you can all imagine like steve and andrew sitting opposite each other here i mean you know maybe the fridge might be a bit too boring but you know the flowers are nice so i, I imagine julie put the flowers there to just like sprite it up a little bit and you know you, you, you've got a commodore 64 one end you know and they're, poking, they're looking over the monitors at each other aren't they? and that's that this is this is how it started off for graph gold as it did a lot of programmers of course yeah it certainly did i mean i, I had a, a white table which, which used to be a, a, a kind of dining table we also had a, a kind of octagonal glass table in the room and, and andrew had a little desk which i i believe was your dad's desk of, of some end sort, sort of over one side and, and that, that's how we started off with with just a couple of tennis a couple of tape recorders and we had a printer on a, on a camping table in between the two tables, uh, which we shared to to do our listings. And uh, that was a beauty of it. Yeah, you you could start a business off with with um, tens of pounds rather rather than, than, than hundreds or thousands. And uh, it, 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 it was a lovely sort of little atmosphere working in, in that dining room. I had a two year old son at the time, so. Um, I, I kind of kept strict hours. I started at nine, I had tea break at exactly, and my son wasn't allowed in the room 
and till it was tea bag, and he came and said, oh, Daddy, tea's ready, and my wife would make tea. And it kind of structured our day a bit. And Andrew was on flexi time, so you, you generally were, were, were in a bit late and went home a bit late. It's hard to get rid of him in the evening. He just enjoyed... He, he, he didn't want to ever go on holiday. <laughs> no, no uh, it was the same with the weekends. You, you know what, you, what you're trying to achieve, and, and it, it comes to the end of Friday, and, OK, we, we're going to go out and have a beer. But... You think, well, I'm going to be away from the machine for two days. I'm not sure how I'm going to manage. And Monday morning couldn't come quick enough. It's very, it's very strange. It's all turned around just because it's, it's just you're having such a good time. It didn't feel like a real job. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Right, we um, are about half an hour into the talk. We still haven't actually got to the start of graph gold. <laughs> So I think maybe we better move things along a little bit here. Uh, so Steve, having uh, completed the Sidam trilogy, you um, decided to move on to something a bit more complex to sort of stretch your skills a little bit more. So tell us, tell us um, as, as succinctly as you can about the beginning of Avalon. Now, this really was a quantum leap for me. You know? We used to play Dungeons and Dragons, Andrew, me, and a couple of other friends. And, and I thought, well, you know, it would be good to get that kind of theme and, and a feeling of exploring in a game. And I'd seen Attic Attack and, and seen how a kind of wireframe could be used to, to sort of suggest you in a place. And I thought, well, what if you, you get that down so that the player's looking into the, the screen, rather like a TV programme, and um, I... I've got a couple of bits of paper and I cut one out to represent the screen, a, a, a really large A2 bit of paper. And then I, I drew just a wireframe kind of room in the other and I kind of moved it behind the wireframe to, to check that it didn't look strange because I couldn't alter the angles with perspective or anything. It just had to scroll about. And um, I found, well, it worked on paper. So then I did the same on the screen. and. You can actually see parts of Lunatech in there because the, the bottom of the wall is the horizon in Lunatech. I just changed that to wall graphics and then I put the odd kind of feature like a brickwork so that randomly and um, th there it was. I had a room kind of scrolling about and um, at that stage I, I, I really thought oh, I'm really onto something here and I, once I got a door working and then just walking through the door I think wow and it changed really quickly from one, one room to another. That's something you'll always notice about our games there's none of this when you go through a door you have to wait for it to load something or to build the next screen and, and whatever it's always instantaneously walking from one room to another and I feel that's really important in a, in a kind of a active game. It's just sort of one of those little things that, that, that we really used to do. And of course, you followed Avalon up with uh, Dragon Talk, uh, which used a similar sort of engine, included this very nice map as well, which had a, a poem written by yourself on the back, semi explaining in ultimate style uh, what you had to do in the game, all these nice little locations. Um, and you drew these locations, and then it was adapted by Houston into this, into this lovely map. That, that's right. And I wanted to get a real sense of reality, and, and even in Avalon, I was, I was, I was kind of looking at books and, and picking things like, like the rod that Marek carries. The, the, the little um, bronze piece on the top is actually in the British Museum. And so I, I, was, I was kind of trying to make it as if it all could be true, and I based it all under the tour of Glastonbury. Um, that uh, this one, I, I did a lot of research in in um, the, the old realms of, of England, and uh, I, I I thought yeah, there's a, there's a sort of sort of certain romance. It was kind of influenced a lot by Tolkien. I, I liked his idea in in his book that he had the lost realm of of Angmar or, or, or something like that, and that that was the feeling that I want to get, where there was a kind of sense of a history. And you're told a bit of it, but not all of it, and it kind of gives you this feeling there's kind of something bigger underneath. And I try to get that, the sense of that in the plot, and I think that that, that kind of holds the, the Dragon Talk game together a lot better than the, the first one. Yeah, yeah very, both very good games, and in comparison with what else, I mean, don't forget, 
folks, this was 1984 they both came out, wasn't it? So a lot of other companies were still doing arcade clones, simple, I mean, Jet Set Willy was probably around, so a lot of uh, games were uh, platform clones or simple shoot 'em up So this was, this was quite different for the time, and it kind of propelled uh, Graph Gold into the big time. And actually, uh, around this time was when Graph Gold was, 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 was formed, Steve. That's right. We, we, I suddenly realised, well, if, if I get loads and loads of royalties in, in one year, the tax man is going to absolutely clobber me, and then next year if our games don't sell, well, I'll, I'll, I'll be stuffed. So I had a word with the accountant, he says, look, you know, what you need to do is set up a limited company. I can take one off the shelf for you. So he, he got one, he, he said, he, it's got a funny name, it's called Graph Gold. If, you know, um, if, if you give us a, the new name, in, in a couple of weeks, I'll, I'll set it all up for you. And we, we sort of fought between us and we couldn't think of anything better. So, so <laughs> it, it was just the name that the clerk who, you know, you, you have clerks that set up hundreds of these like little companies and it was just the off the shelf name. It was just fate, wasn't it? Simple, it was a nice yeah, name, yeah. To be. And then, um, I don't know if any of you, you, you guys must remember the uh, Dundurak, Tiernanog, uh, games that Gargoyle did. There's actually a similarity to those games to this one because the third game in that series, uh, Mars Ball, uh, was originally meant to be another fantasy type game but obviously Star Wars, uh, I think it might be Return of the Jedi had just come out, was a big influence. All the publishers wanted sci-fi games and Steve, you originally intended um, there to be a third game in the um, Avalon drank talk to make that a trilogy, but it ended up becoming uh, another side end game. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But I, I always had planned three games, and in in the third game, the the, the sword Caliburn was going to come into it, and in the stone, because it was going to end up the final scene where where a, a kind of prototype Arthur takes the sword from the stone, and that was the whole reason of the first game, putting the sword in the stone. At, at, at the end of the game, but um, Hugh Cusson said to me, um, he showed me the sales figures of Dragon Talk, and it hadn't done initially as well as um, Avalon, and he was projecting the same, well, if, if you extrapolate this graph, we're not going to sell any of the decks. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I took his advice, and, and we, we made it into a space game, but I, I've, I've always wanted to do the, the trilogy to, to this day. I'd, I'd like to do the third one in the series and to, to just kind of complete it because it, it's kind of like an unfinished work. Well, I think you've got a few potential customers here, Steve, if you ever get around to doing that. And ne next up um, actually is a game not written by either of you two and uh, a conversion of a Commodore 64 game which they said couldn't be done, Meridium. So this was written by uh, Dominic Robinson, very talented chap who eventually joined uh, Graph Gold. So um, Andrew, tell us a little bit about your thoughts on uh, the spectrum conversion of uh, Iridium, and don't forget that point I promised you later. <laughs> nobody, nobody had ever really considered that Iridium could, could be written on the spectrum. Um, because of the, uh, the smooth scrolling at, at 50 frames per second rate. So we, we, we sort of pretty much forgot about the idea, but um, I think Dominic had sent a, a demo into Houston, um, demonstrating that he, he, he could get it running at least 25 frames a second, um, which again, we, we hadn't even considered would be possible. Um, so uh, yeah, well, I think we, we went up there to have a look at it, um, or it was sent down to us and brought down to us, I can't remember, but uh, yeah, we saw it and thought, well, oh, this, this guy knows what he's doing. So, um, yeah, we, I think, think he was brought in house at Houston's to, to do this piece of work. So, well, it's, it's, it's incredible. Yes, that's right. Yeah, it's, and it's an incredible game. He did a marvellous job, Dominic, and um, it, I, I think it got crash smash. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it got crash smash. Funny enough, Houston, like when he, he showed it to me, he. He, so it's just a demo. He's taken up the whole machine by putting the uh, background in eight times, sort of fully load out. So there's, there's no way he could make it into production game. And he was sort of poo pooing it. And, and I said to him, look, this guy's a genius. Get him in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very talented chap. And as you say, he ended up joining Graph Gold. So we'll, we'll, we'll come back to Dominic soon, I think. And then me meanwhile, talking of the Commodore 64 and conversions, Steve, you were busy on this game. And we, we, just before we, we ask you about this, I'm going to ask 
spectrum hero again. We've got the uh, War of the Worlds question earlier, so he gets to answer, answer, ask, answer another one now. How do you pronounce this game? Ooh, he's done his research, isn't he? Oh, yes, I, I always called this Quasitron growing up, but of course it's Quasitron or Quasitron, isn't it? Quasitron, Quasitron. is what I say. Yeah. As in Quasar. <laughs> so tell, tell us a bit about the genesis of uh, Quasitron. And uh, Andrew's influence, obviously, with uh, with Paradroid. Yeah, it was quite interesting because I, I, I'd seen a couple of kind of isometric games, and, and I was thinking, well, how have they actually done that? And I've, I've, I, I was kind of looking at some of the old games, like one of the earliest ones I remember was um, Ant Attack, and uh, thinking, well, how, how do you do it, and how will the game work if things go behind things? And, and when I thought about it, I thought it would be actually better if, if things didn't go behind things and if it, you could do a, a, a kind of convex kind of shape. And it turned out to be the kind of shape of a ziggurat. And I, I made a working um, demo of the game and I called it Ziggurat. And I had no idea at all of what the game was going to be. Um, and I, I had all the slopes and, and the whole, whole kind of uh, graphics and I took it up to Houston and he liked it, but, but what's the game? So I, I had to come back and I was trying to think of how I'm going to actually start walking characters up the slope and I, I realised it would be much better if it was like a little droid with a little point and about that time Paradroid was, was absolutely a success and we didn't think it, it would be possible to do a scrolling version of, of Paradroid on, on the spectrum to, to so uh, Andrew said, well, why not just put the gameplay on top of my, my graphic demonstration? Because it, it, it looked like a paradoid map if you looked at it sort of from the top. And all Andrew's mechanisms, like patrol points to send the little robots out, worked on, because on, it really is a, a map with square tiles, just like paradoid is. Um, and of course, it was a, it was another big hit, another another excellent game, and, a, and another crash smash. And you you took the concept of the uh, well, we didn't just take the concept. You took the whole game uh, or this mini game, and um, and and, in, and put that into uh, Quasitron as well. So did did you try and come up with a mini game of your own, or just think that this was like just great and I should just use that? No, we we knew it would work well on the spectrum, and they're actually Andrew's graphics there. He, he, okay. He, he, he did all the graphics for me while I was doing the code and then, then I just put them in. And uh, yeah, I, I basically took his 6502 and because uh, he, he started off with the source code and, and what, whatever and I just changed it into Z80 and, and put it in and found a bug in it. But, uh, <laughs> we won't mention <laughs> And then, and then, of course, you, 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 you use the concept again, this Paradroid way of working, and you use that again for your, your, your next game, Rana Rama, another Houston game, uh, which rather unfortunately got lumped in by Houston into the sort of Gauntlet uh, clone sort of um, thing that was happening at the time with the release of the official Gauntlet game. But it's actually a very good game, obviously, and a lot more complex than simply going around shooting stuff. Yeah, the, the, the concept from the start was, was to do uh, an, uh, uh, a kind of magical, mystical type paradroid because I, I still like the, the, the paradroid kind of gameplay. I thought, well, it, it would work and, yeah, I could use magic spells instead of wizards and uh, make it the, the look more like a paradroid. But, I, I, again, I thought, well, I'm, I'm not going to try and scroll at the spectrum. Instead, I'll make it a flick screen thing. But I'll make the screen kind of open up as you explore it, which I don't think I, I've seen anyone else do at the time. It gives you a great kind of sense of um, exploration. And, and uh, you, you can then look, look at the, the overall map that, that you get to deduce where there's secret rooms and then, then search hidden walls so, so it, it, it it kind of all, all kind of added to, to the mystique of it and it, and it was another big hit as well another crash smash and while we're on that subject obviously uh, when, when we were at zap live andrew was talking about his uh, excellent relationship with zap and newsfield he did the uh, the developer diaries and whilst you didn't do any developer diaries for uh, crash you had a very excellent relationship with them, not, notwithstanding the reviews, which were usually good. This is a little preview here of, of, of Avalon, and then um, some reviews as well. Obviously, it was known as Legend of Avalon at the start. But the crash smashes were, were pretty much non-stop for, for you, Steve. 
Uh, they were, and across quite a w wide range of games. I, 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 I tried to kind of uh, make each kind of game have, have, have a thing to be. Avalon Dragon Talk was the exception because one was kind of an extension of, of the other and kind of planned that way. But I, I didn't just stick to the same, same genre and I, I like to kind of come up with completely different concepts. And, and, and it, it, it kind of worked because I, I, I was just, just they, they have a common thing that I try and create an environment in which is really believable and that you can explore and I, I, I just love that in a game. And of course we've got the holy grail of uh, a couple of covers as well. Here's the cover that Ollie Frey did for uh, Astro Clone. So it's a very uh, exciting combative cover there. And then he also did a cover, this is one of my favourites, for Flying Shark, which we'll, we'll, we'll get onto shortly. And then um, this is the review for uh, Lunar Attack. So this is in issue, from issue four of Crash. And in issue four, it was the first issue where they actually gave out Crash Smashes. So before that, they had Games of the Month. And I think Orc Attack was the third Crash Smash in the issue, and 3D Lunar Attack was the fourth. Can anyone remember the first? The first Crash Smash in Crash, in that issue four. Wow. No Spectrum games at all, no one can think of any. Well done to the man in the front. Yes, Jet Set Willy was the first to Crash Smash. So anyway, moving on. Um, this book started to become uh, the start of uh, Graph Gold's publisher woes, in as far as we're approaching the uh, end of the ape era, or certainly, you know, it's starting to end. And Steve, um, you're going to tell us a little bit about what happened with Houston and why Magnetron, uh, Quasitron's excellent follow-up, uh, ended up being published by Firebird and not Houston. Yeah, I was working on Magnetron and, and pretty much Andrew was in about the same stage of his game Morpheus for Houston. And we, we were just sort of presenting copies coming up to the, the, the final one. So we were in the later stages of it. So most of our work had been done, yet the publishing was still to be done. And we knew by this time, we knew Dominic and John from uh, Houston and they, they used to phone us up on quite a regular basis and, and chat. Um, they started um, telling us these stories, saying things are going to pieces here. Um, you know, bills are unpaid, um, staff are walking out, there's a lot of rows in, in the office um, and whatever. And then one day I had uh, a phone call from his second in command, Debbie Silito, and she was saying, I've, I've left Houston. And it was a real shock to me. She was kind of like the marketing manager there. And, and she said, she's joined Telecom Soft. And she said, you know, you, you need to do something because your games are not going to be published. Houston is going to disappear. And um, to me, that, that was terrible. To have two games not published after we've, we've, we've spent about six months on them, haven't we? And, and it, it, it would have just been doomed for us. So um, Telecom said, look, can we see the contracts? And when it said there aren't any contracts for the later games with Houston, um, he didn't used to do contracts. And so they said, well, we've got a big legal fund and we've got legal things and we'll, we'll, we'll let them have a look at this. And they, they said, oh, we'll, they'll, they'll back us. They said, we don't think he's got any, any um, hold on you. We want to publish these games. You know, why don't you come over and, and work for us? And it seemed to us a no-brainer no at the time because three separate staff were, were telling us the same story that, you know, that's it, he's going out of business. I think they were saying he's not going to publish the games. He'd, he had arranged to kind of sub them to another publisher. And that, and that was a kind of trick that publishers used to do. Because um, you used to get, we, we got 20% of royalties as a rule from Houston. But if another publisher published it, Houston may get 20% from them. And, and then well, we actually had a, had a separate agreement with uh, Houston that said we, we get 40%, but 40% of 20% isn't 20%. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's a bit, a bit unfortunate that, wasn't it? And then, of course, um, after all um, the, the sort of stress of all this, Houston pulled through. Yeah, I mean, I believe Jeff Brown helped him out in the end, and, and uh, you know, it, it was a turnaround, and then the cook kind of turned around and says, well, and you, you know, we're not letting telecoms off publish the game so 
our two games got us stuck in this kind of legal battle, and which we were just kind of almost like like pawns. I, I remember reading one kind of press article. Unfortunately, the press, because Houston knew him so well, they kind of sided with him. And there was one article saying, oh, we've just done it for the money. But it, it wasn't. We weren't getting more money. The idea was we'd get some money rather than no money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was survival. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right, we're going to... The Flying Shark was uh, Dominic Robinson and John Cummings. Excellent. Um, Excellent shoot 'em up, based obviously on the arcade game of the same name, or called Sky Shark in, uh, in in America. I always thought John's uh, signature in the bottom left was a bit unfortunate. I could have made that a bit clearer the C there. Just, uh, anyway. uh, but yeah, an, an excellent game. But we're going to skip past Flying Shark because we're running running short a bit of time. And I want to talk a bit about this game, Soldier of Fortune, because this is probably one of your lesser known games. Uh, it was written by David O'Connor, was it? Yeah, this game? Yeah. yeah, and uh, one of the things that uh, is, is, is quite cool, obviously the title is a bit odd considering it's a fantasy type game, uh, was the advertising campaign which Firebird employed. So we'll do, that's a screenshot of the game. So it looks a bit Stormlordish, doesn't it? And there's, that you, you, there's a fantasy plot behind it that you're collecting these things, aren't you? And uh, this was the advert. Which was a bit bizarre. I mean, obviously that's Humphrey Bogart. Uh, I, I did a bit of research uh, prior to this talk, and apparently that's not from a movie. That's that shot. It's from uh, an advert for uh, the raincoat he's wearing. And yeah, it's like they took the title and um, decided on this rather bizarre advertising campaign. So as a result, obviously this this game, despite being excellent, didn't didn't really sell many copies. Steve. That's right. I mean, if I recall. Um that they published a, a kind of group of our games at the time, uh, but the game that they actually had and they spent all their, their publishing money on it, I think it was called Savage, which was a sort of barbarian copy. And, and the marketing manager loved it because he showed it to me and it had a kind of giant sprite that was so big that you couldn't see it. I think time to react to axes and things come towards you. So I, I, I thought the game wasn't actually very good myself. But she said, look, we, we can't market something we can't see. Your, your game has such little spikes and, and whatever, but I don't think she understood the speech. <laughs> well, I, I urge you, if you haven't played Soldier of Fortune, to check it out. It's a really, uh, I mean, it obviously started off as like a, a Ghosts and Goblins type game, but it's, it's, it's been expanded a lot. It, it's a sleek game, isn't? and it runs at 25 frames a second, I, I believe. It's, it's sort of one of the few games that does that. It, David came with the game, like, like that's what he bought um, with him when he came to his interview and I looked at him and thought, oh this guy really knows his stuff and yeah, yeah, we, we offered him a job and uh, then I said, look, we'll, yeah, we'll get your game published and uh, he then spent a few months sort of rewriting it and then John Cumming wrote a sort of a very different version of it rather than copying it onto the C64. Yeah, excellent game, so that's your homework everybody. Right, on to the next game, and we have Intensity. So back to you, Andrew, because this is an original design by you, this game. Yeah, I, I, just like Steve, I, I like to change every every game I do. I want to do something different, because you figure if I, if I just wrote one shoot em up after another, I, I've already used all my ideas up on, on the first game. Um, so I've got nothing left for the second game, so I like to change, change the genre. And I, I just wanted to do a little puzzle game um, and it used the graphical style of Iridium um, but we had a sprite multiplexer running which took nearly all of the all of the, the CPU time so I wouldn't have time to scroll quickly so I, I just made it a static uh, puzzle game um, which by uh, good, good fortune made it convertible to uh, to the Spectrum um, and the Amstrad which uh, Steve here knocked up in no time at all, I seem to remember, even though it was my biggest program ever. It's a 29k of, of actual assembler code, um, which is nearly half, half the Commodore 64 and, and way more than that in, in the 48k Spectrum. So I'm not quite sure how we managed to fit it all in there anyway. Perhaps, perhaps you can tell me how you managed to do it so quickly. <laughs> Did he, did he stand up and go, I'm finished, when he done it? <laughs> so, so. And, well, it's quite weird, because I, I took Flying Shark, um, which, which had a, a, a kind of two-by-two two kind of tiling mechanism behind it, and although this one didn't scroll, the Dominic's kind of 
method for doing that fitted in, into the game and, and the size of all the graphics just, just absolutely dovetailed. So um, I, I took Dominic's code for that, so I didn't have to write any graphics code, and all, all Dominic's sprite routines, of, just, just as, as they were, and I converted Andrew's code for the actual game code. And, and my method of conversion was to convert the whole lot get all the cokes, by that time I was using a Z80 assembler on, on the PC, I, I put Andrew's code there and then, then you, using editor kind of macros, just do replaces of, of the most common kind of instructions from the Z80, from the, the 6502 to Z80. And it, it feels quite easy going that way because the Z80's got a more comprehensive instruction set than the, the 6502 and, and uh, then once I've got the whole code converted and, and compiled up I wouldn't try and run the whole lot of, at once I, I then you know start get the control routine working get that link it to the, the graphics and, and then gradually kind of introduce the game routines in one by one and check them out and test them excellent excellent and then we had uh, this amazing conversion it's one of the best arcade conversions on the deck spectrum written by david was it again with graphics from uh from, from john and this had a bit of a, a convoluted history how you ended up doing this because obviously this is uh, published by ocean the sequel to bubble bubble uh, uh, the original bubble bubble and uh, it's a very sweet peaceful game where you get to kill lots of things with rainbows so maybe steve you can uh, you can tell us about a little bit about the story of um, how you came to publish uh, or how you came to develop sorry rainbow islands yeah and we didn't we didn't get every version did we because we didn't have the console versions but the um telecom soft were quite pleased with what we've done with uh flying shark and, and that really put us in in a pole position to, to do some like they, they they came to us with it and said well, well do we want to do this you know um so, so I, I come up with a figure and thought well it's going to be darn near impossible and uh, they said yep yeah, fine <laughs> and uh so, yes yeah, so, so we um started doing it and, and it, it was the, f the first real game that we, we were doing a, a real multi format thing because um, i think we did spectrum Amstrad, um, C64, and Andrew did the Amiga and Atari version. So, so it, it, it was quite a big project for us. It was the first time we, we had almost everyone in the, the company working on the same project. I was probably the only person that, that wasn't working on it at the time. I, I think Dominic, Kai, he, he did the kind of operating system, and then Dominic was doing similar, but you know, most of the the uh, company was, was engaged in, in some way or the other. But we actually were given the arcade board and, and the cabinets. So um, uh, David was very, very good at uh, playing arcade games and, and he could play the whole thing through. And John Cumming filmed him playing it one, one night, sort of through one end to the other. And th they used the video that they produced for that, and, and they'd, they'd, he'd kind of scroll through the video and copy all, all the graphics from the video. But we also had quite a, a lot of um, design documentation. And there were, there were some nice little, little extra bits in there we found, that, like um, that there was a, a, a pickup that, that gave um, infinite power to uh, the, the, the character. So. Uh, the, 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 the little diagrams, that had a thing, and he stripped off his shirt and he had a little Superman costume. <laughs> How did the game end up being published by Ocean, though, uh, Steve? Well, Telecomsoft sold out to Microprose, and uh, the story I heard was that someone walked into Taito's office and said, well, we own the rights now, so we're going to publish this, and that's not how you talk to the Japanese. <laughs> so they said, no, you're not. And uh, they they wouldn't even negotiate with them. So so uh, basically, we we were stuck with uh, the the publisher not having the license to publish it. And uh, in the end, uh, I, I I knew Fergus McGovern from Probe and was relating the story to him. And he was saying, oh, he knows the guy from Taito quite well. You know, he'll, he'll have a word and he, he had a word with them and he also knew the guys at, at Ocean 
and it, he, he was very good. He, he, he kind of did me a favour and he acted as, as a go-between and actually uh, made the thing happen. But it, 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 at the time, it was a terrible blow for us because we knew the product was really good. We, we were so pleased with the results. And when you've done something like that and put your heart in it and the whole company's worked on it and then you realise no one's going to play it, it's just like a slap in the face. You know, people were so depressed. And uh, I, mean, I, I can't remember whether people actually went there, but they talk of people going and shortly after pe people left. And it, 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 it wasn't just that game. We had a whole series of games that we, we started and for one reason weren't published. And you, you, know, you can't run a business like that. Of course, 1990 was when Rainbow Islands came out, so we, we, we're right at the end of the, or more or less the end of the Spectrum era now, the 8-bit era. Uh, you did have time to do Super Off-Road, which was another arcade conversion, this time for, for Virgin, which was no, another excellent game. Um, which, um, was your last, was that your last Spectrum game? It must have been one of the last, if it wasn't the actual last one, Steve, do you think? Yeah, yeah probably. Um... I, mean, did it, I, th I think I did the Spectrum version, didn't I? Because yes. that was the first time that I worked with the team doing arcade conversions because I, I, I was busy trying to fulfil this, this contract we had with Telecom. So when we signed with, with them, they, they, they sort of gave, it was the first time we ever had an advance and they gave us an advance as if they want four titles um, over two formats. And we, we just were ages trying to uh, satisfy by this. And, uh, and these were 8-bit titles, although when when they seduced us into going over, they said, what we want you to do is work on 16-bit. But as soon as we'd signed them, they said, oh, no, we, yeah, we want you to, to concentrate on, on all these 8-bit titles. So we, intensity was, was one of those. But uh, after that that all, all happened, well, then I, I joined the team to, to do this one. This one, I believe it was Virgin yeah. that, that we... We did it for they'd, they'd seen what we'd done with Rainbow Islands, and uh, yeah, they, they I think they actually come up with, with the offer and said, Yo, do you, do you want to do it? And I, I jumped at the, the chance, and um, yeah, it, it, it all it, it would, probably this was one of the most smoothest games with publishers in that era that we actually had because it was actually <laughs> finished and published for, for Virgin. Um, the, the only sort of downside to it, there was a Game Gear version, and because we weren't registered Nintendo developers, they wouldn't let us do the Game Gear version. So this this other guy who was working on his own, um, or not, not Game Gear, uh, it was the little Nintendo Game Boy. Ga game Boy. Yeah, because I actually did the Game Game Gear version with the, 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 the little Sega and the Master System. Um, very lucrative. And, and he probably got as much as I, or far more than the Spectrum version, but under the contract, um, I had to surrender the Z80 source code. And so this guy got all my code to convert um, uh, on, on to, to, to the, the, the Game Boy, which is a lot easier than having to do it than work, work out or yeah. how you do it all, all, all yourself. And he even some bits he couldn't get working, so he, he, you know he begged me. And one day he came down, and and I helped him with some of the the, the work, and got no, nothing for that. Yes. But it is it is at though, uh, Stephen and Andrew, that this was uh, another excellent game. So throughout all the games we've seen, um, you know they, they were always very well high, highly praised. Whether they sold well or not, for whatever reason, especially in Soldier of Fortune's case, they were always very excellent games. And I think the dedication to producing not only those excellent games, but also the variety of genres and excellent has, has strong through over the years. And it's probably why we're sitting here now and there's so many people listening to us talk about um, these days. So if I can just go back to you briefly, Andrew, uh, I just want to wrap up now and talk about uh, the 8-bit the, the era in particular and working uh, with Steve at, um, at Graph Gold throughout the 80s. Uh, what, that, what that was like for you, what that means for you now. Um, yeah, we, cause the, there were lots of uh, format wars and things, people were saying, oh, my machine's better than yours, and that's all because well, we, we like to protect what we what we bought ourselves. There wasn't any such rivalry of machines. You know, it was us against 
our individual machines all the time. So, uh, and we, we work largely independently. And I was always trying to make sure that I impressed the boss, because when you're sitting next to the boss, you, you, you've got to do a good job all the time. Um, so, um, we, we were competitive, you know, when, when, when the old uh, royalty sheets came in, it was all oh, who sold more this month, and um, and he used, it's usually Steve. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, 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 we just enjoyed working on our individual machines, uh, and, and we enjoyed play testing each other's games when we did, um, and and just the, the whole 8 bit era was just, it, it was a time when each of us could do most of the work on our own games. So we had total control, we were designing the games, we were writing the games, testing the games, doing the graphics. Um, Steve did a lot of my sound effects and music, and I, I did a few graphics for him on his Spectrum games. So we, we, we were contributing to each other's games, and, and I think we lifted e each other's um, sort of quality um, to, to make sure that we, all, we were always doing the best that we could. Um, so I, I, I thought it was great, great times. Um, it's, it's nice having the total control over your game. You know, if you if you just think, right, well, I want to draw this and I want it to do that, you could just get on with it and do it. I didn't even have to ask permission to do anything. Um, and and just seeing your games being reviewed and getting great reviews, it, it was all fantastic. And getting a cu cover on Zap sixty four when when I got Paradroid on the cover. That robot blew me away. Uh, Ollie did such a fantastic job of that. I, I begged them to get that artwork on, on our box, cassette box, because the Paradroid artwork was not very good on the box, I didn't think. Um, but we, we couldn't get it anyway. But uh, it's just great to see that that inspired such fabulous artwork. And Ollie got exactly what I was aiming for just by looking at the game and saying, oh, I'll pick that robot and I'll just render it as best as he could. And it, and it just looked fantastic. So, um, yeah, the the eight bit era was was was, was I think my, my best time because I, I was just getting on with the job and and was able to do it. Um, and, and and people were appreciating what we were doing. And, and this, as you've heard, it's just been a lot of crossover. Steve's taken some of my designs. I've taken bits of his code. Um, and and then, yeah, it was it was just a great time. Best job ever. Said that best job ever. And, and have you had a holiday yet? <laughs> I can now have a holiday, yes. No. <laughs> Excellent. Before we take a few questions from the audience, um, Steve, can you just uh, add your final thoughts? Well, one of the things that um, sort of I remember is, is towards the end of the game, you, you kind of get to a state when, when you're sort of confident, you think, well, it, you know, it plays really nice and I love it, but what are the magazines going to think? And, it, and it, it's a sort of side of it you don't realise. There's a point where you've got to let go of this thing. You've got to stop working on it. You hand over your baby to the publisher and then you wait. And sometimes I was so nervous I, could, I couldn't even look at the magazines. You wait and, and to hear what the feedback is before you re read the view, reviews. And it, oh, it's one set of, it's, it's sort of more relief when, when you open the page and you get something like, like a crash smash. Cause you, you just don't know what someone's going to say about something, and it's really like a stab. If someone even just puts a like a little, little bit of criticism, like, like I think on my first game, they criticise the, the sound. But I, I used to plug my Spectrum into a two by twelve guitar speaker, and the sound was phenomenal. And I tuned it all up for that sound. So I was thinking, well, never people, heard that before. <laughs> people will plug their Spectrums into hi fi's and things. I mean, I've made up little leads that. That, that, that just, just just went in mine because it was just like a standard like like little mini jack and and you only appreciate what I did with the sound if, if you do that and you hear all these great big deep booms and things when you blow up and, and the phasing of the laser shots instead of the little ch -ch 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 from, from the spectrum I think well you, you haven't heard the sound how can you comment on it you, you wouldn't say that but you feel very, very kind of vulnerable at, at times like, like that, and uh, yeah, I think it's a side of it people don't don't appreciate. But then afterwards, you get when when um, not only the press, but then then you know people at shows and things, and then especially now, forty years later, people s still ask you questions about the games and say, oh, yeah, I grew up play playing that. You get such a kind of sense inside, you know that. that You've done something right, and it was all worthwhile. And at the time, we thought these were 
like hit singles, like they were thrown away and people wouldn't remember them the next year. But you know, how, how wrong we were. Yes, we're all here 40 years later talking about them still, which I'm sure you couldn't have imagined back in the day. Well, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Steve, for, for sharing your thoughts with us. Let's have a round of applause for these two questions. We've got time for one or two questions from the audience. If anyone would like to all hand shot up straight over there, let's go over there. Um, are there any games that you wish you'd written? I mean, sort of games you were jealous of and you really thought were good? Uh, both, actually. Yeah. A, a, a couple. Um, some of the breakthrough games on, on the spectrum, like, like Night Law, as soon as I saw that, I thought, oh, yeah, yeah I'd like to do, do one like that. And I never did quite, quite I, I suppose, um, Quasitron was the closest I, I kind of got to that, and that was me playing around with, with, with textures. But, yeah, it was the kind of thing that I would have been capable of, but they thought of it first. And the other one later, I think I'd stopped work on the spectrum. When I saw our type, I thought, wow, I don't believe that. Uh, and that, that's probably one of the only Spectrum games that I, I just felt I had to disassemble to find out, well, how did they do that? I don't, I don't know if I could do that. And when I, I saw it, it was close to some of the techniques that Dominic used to use. And, and uh, I think Dominic actually sat by me and, and you know, helped us find, we, we sort of searched and found the innermost graphics routines. But yeah, yeah that, those two games kind of stand out on, on, the, on the Spectrum. Andrew, is there anything on the Commodore 64 you wish you'd written? Uh, well, I was always chasing after the arcade games because um, we, we played arcade games. We loved playing arcade games all the time and their hardware was so much more expensive than, than the home computers, um, even though the, the actual CPUs were quite often 8-bit CPUs, some 16-bit. Um, so it, it, my... my I'd have loved to have written some arcade games, to be honest with you, where they can just say, well, I want a thousand sprites, and they'll go, yeah, all right, and we'll put, a, put an extra chip in for you, and you can do it. So, um, I, I, wish, I wish I'd got some of, some of Jeff Minder's creativity sometimes, because um, uh, he, he, he was always writing such smooth games. Um, but I, I, I like, like to think that, that um, I, I got most things out of my system <laughs> in, the t in the time. Yeah, fair enough. Anyone else got a question? Okay, sorry. Hi. Um, probably should have Googled this one so I didn't have to waste everybody's time, but who came up with the name Iridium and not use it? Iridium, which is the, the actual metal. Uh, yes, okay, that's a, that's an easy one. Um, I was looking for a, for a game, um, game name because what I was doing was taking... Uh, my game work in progress to, to, to my ex-colleagues in, in Chelmsford uh, from GDC. I, I used to go and visit them every weekend and take my latest progress copies uh, of my games and, and just get their opinions and how playable they were. And it was uh, one of the chaps called Robert Orchard who, uh, who suggested the, na the, the name Iridium because he, he had mistaken it for Iridium. Um, so he, he got his chemistry wrong in the first place and, and I, and I, and I like the name. We, we did look it up and, and go, no, you, 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 because um, he, he said, well, I thought it really existed and it didn't. Um, so it was great because because I think we got to the stage where, because of our trouble with War of the Worlds game, game names, we wanted to come up with names that were our own words. Um, so so uh, that just fitted perfectly. So it was Robert Orchard, who, uh, who was one of my ex-colleagues from GEC, um, he suggested the name and I liked it and it stuck. And now we're going to, we're, we're, we're thinking, um, I think Rana Rama and Iridium were coming out at about the same time, so we're, we're thinking we're doing a crossover called Urid Rama or uh, <laughs> Rana Iridium. It all works, it's all great. Excellent, thank you, Andrew. One more question over here. Hi, right, Steve. Um, for me, Dragon Talk is the best game on the spectrum ever and probably on any 8-bit platform. I've read your Twitter blog and I believe you have some notes for the sequel. You, you planned it out. So my question is, how complete is the design for the sequel to Dragon Talk on paper 
and how many children do I have to sell to make you produce it? I've only got one child, by the way. I got as far as I, I laid out a brief, not, not for one game, but for three games. Um, so I thought, well, I'll start the trilogy again. And um, the first one was in more detail, but it, it sort of suggested well, the, the synopsis of, of the N2 games. The, the control mode um, was completely reworked, and if, if I remember rightly, it was kind of on joystick directions, um, sort of looking at games like Mortal Kombat, how, how you got different things. And the easy spells were like single joystick shifts, and then you've got another range of spells which was like double shifts. So you you can go right and up or right and down, or you could go right, right for enough. And and they were kind of theme the spells. So all the spells in a certain area, you missile spells all over to the right. And, and the the stronger they were, the more kind of um, jiggly poker you had had to do to get them. But they all laid out in the grid, so you could have a nice little diagram of the spells around you as, as you kind of learn them, the different kind of things in. So rather like you're, you're kind of you know, whizzing your, your, your wand in, in a certain pattern. So all that was all worked out. The the actual adventure mechanism was exactly um, the one from Dragon Talk, so, so how objects interacted with, with other objects. Um, mm -hmm. may, maybe a couple of improvements, but that, 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 was, a, that was actually coded up. Um, and we actually had a character walking around picking up things and it had the mouse sequence with the cheese and the, the um, hole in the skirting ball ju just there to sort of prove to a publisher that that, that all, all worked. And the, the, the synopsis of the adventure, I'd, I'd listed out all, all the kind of stages of it. And it, was, it, was, it was basically, um, there were dragon's eggs that you, you had to find and these eggs had been planted under cities to kind of corrupt them. So you're trying to save the world. And, and the, the three adventures took you completely across the world. The first one takes you to Ireland and, and uh, back back into the, the, the Avalon kind of scenario and around Britain. And then it goes over to, to the Black Forest and un, under Germany and things, under Rome, there, there was one. Um, there, there was Aztec temples, everywhere where there's archaeological ruins, basically. And the idea was, well, these dragon's eggs have brought the civilizations down, and you're trying to save all, all the ancient civilizations by, by getting these eggs. So, so yeah, it, and, and that, that existed as a, a document that we took around publishers. So it, it's, it's a kind of bit of a salesy kind of document, but it does specify the, the details of how the game was run. And it had two characters. It had. Um, uh, uh, a magic character, but this time it, it had a character to protect the magic character, who was a girl, and, and she, she was kind of like a prototype Guinevere. Um, but I, I saw her as a, as a kind of uh, almost like a Red Sonia type type of figure, long, long red hair, had, had a huge kind of sword, to, and so she'd fight the minions while while the uh, wizard sort of prepared his, his spells and, and whatever. So. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Now, now you just have to get on with it, Steve. Right, um, we've got time for one more question. In case anyone else, anyone else want to ask a question? Yeah. Oh, this chap over here. Maybe to Steve this one. Apologies, Andrew. But it's just hypothetically, if say there was to be a next remake of Quasar Tron, would you prefer to see it with? Standard spectrum colours, but no colour clash, and then you can recolor Plepto in and, and all the other robots so they don't have to be micro. Or would you say, let's just use the whole range of the colours that it could do and anticipate some complaints that maybe a little bit too much like it as an Amiga game? Would you rather see? Because that's been a bit of a discussion around. Those yeah. of us who have next or are about to. I, th I think I'm, if, if I were doing it, I'd be tempted to kind of actually put in both. So you you kind of had a, uh, a a little switch where you could say, okay, this is the the the, the original kind of spectrum kind of look. But uh, fu funny enough, I was looking at I've, I've just been coming up finishing uh, a PC game, which is a space game, and I was looking at it the other day. And I was thinking, 
all the spaceship colours and the, the, the space stations and everything, I've put spectrum colours in <laughs> And I've kind of done it without our kind of thinking. It's all the ones I've chosen. So so there's, there's a kind of spectrum yellow is, is the, the main ship and there's, there's kind of like the the uh, cyan sort of colour some of the base, bases are, are got on. So there's something in my brain that's kind of still tuned to those, those early days and, and those colours. But you can still put those in and get the spectrum feel, but I've, I've, I've put in kind of lighting so things will glint and, and look metallic and, and whatever. So, so I think you can kind of be sympathetic to the original, but, but kind of up the graphics. And I don't see any reason to not eliminate actual colour clash because, you know, the attributes were... They were something we fought against, but it was something that I bore in mind with my games. Things like uh, Crazytron, if, if you look at it, it's very carefully designed to get a lot of colour all around the, the screen, but then just use two colours for the play field where, where I needed the detail to avoid the clash. Excellent, excellent. Well, it's, it's, it would be lovely to see a version of that, uh, Steve, on the, on the next, certainly, whatever approach you decide to go to. And that before we wrap up things, uh, there's a couple of more things I'd, we, we'd just like to talk about. Firstly, Andrew, Steve and I are working on a uh, fusion book, fusion retro book at the moment, called The Graph Gold Story. So in the theme of fusion's excellent uh, tomes on ocean, US gold and so forth, uh, we're, we're already busy, as you can see. There's quite a, a chunk already written about graph gold. So if you if you if you want some more graph gold uh, in your life, then this book, which will be out uh, next year, will will have will be absolutely full. Obviously, with a lot of input from Andrew and Steve, and also from uh, all the other people, such as Dominic Robinson, uh, that worked at, um, at at graph gold throughout the 80s and 90s, and give you the full story of this absolutely amazing developer. What a lovely cover. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and the, the correct cover as well, yes, as well. So that just about wraps up uh, things for this talk. Uh, I'd just like to uh, announce, in case you didn't know, my name's Graham Mason, and I'm the author of uh, ZX Nightmares. Uh, the sequel to ZX Nightmares is also uh, uh, going to be out next year from Fusion called ZX Dreams. So I finally get to play some decent games, uh, including uh, many, of course, Steve's, which will be in uh, will be in the book as well. And that just about wraps things up for us. Uh, the only thing left is uh, to say thank you for watching, thank you for listening, and thank you to Andrew and Steve for their time. And Chris and his uh, his daughter now are going to be selling signed, uh, lovely signed posters of uh, obviously Steve and Andrew's games, including Avalon, Iridium, the aforementioned uh, Paradroid cover, and the, that lovely Astro Chrome cover, which is one of my favourites. So. Roll up, roll up, come and get your posters, your signed posters by Andrew and Steve, and thanks again everyone for listening. Thank you.